It's good to be back. And um, somebody else has done that before. There's another hymn book in there too, if you're looking for another one. It's always interesting to look at the Bible when one sees it because there's always more to the story than what you read exactly where it is. So today we're going to go back. There's a principle I learned very early in my Christian life and Christian study of the Bible is the principle of first mention. And it's important that we go back to that and to understand what's going on. And today, given that Paul is addressing the subject of circumcision not being necessary for the believer, it's important that we go back and ask that question. What is it? Now, we know what it is physically. We're not going to go to that discussion. But what was it about? And given that Paul had already taken us to Hagar and Sarah and that little episode in Genesis 16 about where they wanted to preempt God and say, well, look, there's a way to, to get God's will to come into being. We can do it. We're going to talk about that. So we're going to see something of the call of Abraham. And one of the things we you see in this first mention stuff is generally the whole story, generally in a very small pricey thing that needs to be expanded with time. Today, we're going to spend a little bit of time in Genesis before we get to Galatians 5. So that's, we're going to start at the very beginning. There was a call of Abraham, and it's in three parts. He had already left Ur of the Chaldees with his dad and went up to Haran in the north uh, part of Israel, what we now know as Israel, and uh, settled there for a while. And then when he was 75 years old, God says to him, time to move, Abraham, I've got a little thing for you i want you to go south i want you to go to this place where i'm going to lead you and it would appear at that time that this is in genesis chapter 12 that he gets up and he just goes following god now this is pretty amazing because ur was a pagan society and no doubt abram was also brought up in that pagan society and pagan study if you look at chapter 11 of genesis that was the tower of babel the confusion of languages. And if you want to know about speaking in tongues, you better start in Genesis 11, because that tells you what it's all about. And that helps you to understand what it's about when you come to the New Testament as well. That's the first mention of tongues, tongues in, the new, in the Bible. And he says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a father, a great nation. And the Bible teaches us that he just went down there in faith. Now he, a few things happened. And... Um, he ended up going down to Egypt because things didn't work out and he really put his foot in his mouth there and almost lost his wife to Pharaoh, the king. Came back up, he had to go and rescue Lot who had parted from him earlier and uh, the, even the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which um, interesting time. But he's now 75 years of old and God is now, he's now moving on and he's come back and it's now about 80 years. Who knows? We're not told exactly how old he was when he had this next encounter with God. But it was before Ishmael was born. So it's 11 years at least, somewhere between, towards the end of the 11 years of when God first said to him, go down to Cana and live there. And so Abraham meets up with God and God says to him, you are going to have a son. You're going to have an heir. This, is, this land I'm going to give you. And he says, well, I haven't got a son, but it's okay. I've got Eliezer, the my manservant from Damascus, he's the one who can take my life and, and carry it on. And um, how often do we try to tell God how we can help him work out his plans? And Abram needed to learn that he needed to lose something, his ability to, tell, to help God with the things that God needed being done because God's got a plan. We talked about that briefly last time I was with you about Jacob and uh, and also Abram, both, in a sense, trying to work it out their way to fulfill God's plans. And in Jacob's case, we don't know how God was going to make him the leader of the people over his brother Esau. It's hidden in history. Or it's more importantly, it's probably hidden in eternity. And we won't know about it then. So God says, you're going to. He said, well, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. But how am I going to know you did this? One of the most amazing things God says to him, well, um, I want you to get three, a heifer, three years old, a she-goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove and a dove, and I want you to cut them in half and lay them in two heaps. 
what a peculiar thing to do. How is that going to tell you that God's going to do this plan? Because we've got to understand the custom of the day. The custom of the day, if you, because most people couldn't read and write, and not only that, didn't have, couldn't go down to office works and get some paper and write up a contract. Didn't happen. And I don't think anybody worked out lawyers could make a lot of money out of this, but they separated that stuff. And the deal was that if you made a, an agreement with somebody, you would both walk through between those two and two lots of piles of animals, dead animals. And as you walk through, that would be a sign to say that you are going to carry out your part of the bargain or your part of the deal. And if you don't, may you also be treated the same way as the animals were. That's the deal. That's how much confidence they put on these agreements. And that's what God asked Abram to do. Must have been, I mean, let's face it, he's over 80 years of age. It obviously been an exhausting day for him and he went into a deep sleep. And whether he was awake when he saw this vision of this heat pot and the, and the torch going through the smoky pot and the torch going through it, but it was symbolic of God going through that because God made a deal and God said, I'm going to carry it out. Now, there's one other document that we have in life that most of us don't ever get to, we get to sign, but never see after we've signed it is it called our will. And it's the decision that I've made. What's going to happen to the rest of the estate after I'm no longer here? I'm the only one who makes that deal. If you're part of the recipient of that, all you can do is accept it. See the promise God's made and God took this walk through there in this vision. And Abraham knew that God's word would be true. He said to him, Abraham, you will bear a son. Now, it seems that uh, they still were having a bit of problems with understanding where the flesh fitted in with the spirituality of God. Because uh, Sarah then comes up with this great idea. Look, we haven't got this child yet. We well, better get one. And uh, there's my maidservant over there. So it doesn't take too much knowledge to know what happened in the tent that night. And 13 years after, Abram was called to go down into Chaldees. Ishmael was born. His illegitimate child, for want of a better term. Some people say he got married to... The Hagar beforehand, there's no indication that that's true. It was part of their custom. If you had a maidservant, she could fulfill your duties for you. So that's what happened. And what a thorn in the flesh that's been for the Israelite people ever since. What a tragedy it's been. So Sarah offers a solution. And this is the second time that a husband has listened to his wife without question. You know, the first time? was in the Garden of Eden. Look, Adam, this fruit, it's good to eat. Boy, it's nice. And where was Adam all the time that Eve was there doing that stuff? He was there beside her. That's what the Bible tells us. And he didn't say, Eve, God has said. Abraham didn't say to his wife, Sarah, God has said. What a failure the men were in both of those occasions to not speak the truth of God's word. That needed to be done. Now, the third time is there. Now it's 99 years of age. And God comes again and says, you are going to have a son and he's going to be the child of promise. And you're going to have this great nation. And he changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Abram meaning the exalted one now to being the father of a multitude of people. And Abram looks at that. He says, but I haven't got a son. It's all right. I've got a son, he's called Ishmael. He can be the one to do it. God says, not your way, Abraham, my way. This is a child of promise. This is a child who's going to be born when children aren't normally born in relationships. Can you marry? I don't know whether he offered Ishmael because he didn't want Sarah to go through a confinement at 90 years of age. I don't know. We're not told. But he offered Ishmael and God says, no, not your way. And sometimes we Christians need to discover that too, not our way, but his way. So he said, okay, you're doing it. And then as part of the deal, now, Abram, I want you to get involved in the covenant and you've got to be circumcised. I've got to tell you, that would be painful at 99 years of age. But it wasn't only to Abraham, it was everybody in his household, Eliza, all the people there, Ishmael. They all had to be circumcised. And then from that day on, every child born in that family 
from eight years of age, eight days of age, would be circumcised. And then a year later, God fulfilled his promise and Isaac was born, even though both Abraham laughed at it and Sarah laughed at the concept. That was his name to remind them that they needed to trust God. He's a child of promise. It's God's doing. It's his way. That's what we need to understand. So that's why we went back there. Circumcision was a sign of the removal of the flesh. No trusting in what I can do, but trust only in what God can do. That's what we need to do. We go back to chapter 4 and verse 28. We read these words. You brothers like Isaac are children of promise. I better keep up with my notes. There we go. Your children is a promise. You see, there's a link between what happened in Genesis 17 and what happens in Galatians 5 and 4 and what happens today. We are children of promise. We've got a link to what happened all those years ago. God made a deal with Abraham and he said, this is what I'm going to do. The offspring, the offspring, of course, that he was talking about was the Lord Jesus Christ who would come and be the savior of the world, who would give his life a ransom for you and I. And then we start with this statement of position. And look at what it says. For freedom Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. You're free. Now, what's that mean, to be free? Well, we're free from the obligation of having to cover sin. We're free from covering, having all to follow the rules of Leviticus. Have you ever read through Leviticus? What a great book to read in. It's, help, it's good for insomnia and a whole raft of other things. But try to understand what it's saying and what all the meanings are. Why do we have to do all these things? They all make sense when you understand that. But that's what the, the children of Israel needed to understand. And they failed at that. Jeremiah tells us, that God says, I'm going to come down and destroy these people who have broken the covenant with me. And those who worked, walked between the dead animals, I'm going to do with them as they deserve. That's what it says in Jeremiah, referring back to that covenant, walking through between the dead heifers and so on. We're free. But we've got to be careful that we don't understand freedom to say, I'm free, but you guys are going to be in bondage because of my freedom. We cannot use freedom to impact on the freedom of others it has to be both personal and it has to be corporate my freedom needs to include you in what i can do sometimes my freedom people think well these judaizers so look we're free we can do all this stuff we can keep days we can have circumcision and you need to do it too otherwise you're not going to be free that's what they were really teaching you do not know the whole truth of God. And yet they were also seem to be saying that Paul was also preaching circumcision, just wasn't doing it as, as, a, heavy, as a heavy ministry. And then he said, we're to stand firm. Stand without moving, trust in God implicitly. That's what it means to do. Moses just led these people who had been in captivity and Egypt for so many years and standing beside the Red Sea and he's got the army of Egypt over there behind the pillar of cloud and fire. He's got the Red Sea in front of him and the people are murmuring, murmuring, why have you brought us out here to die in the desert? And what's he say? Stand still and see the salvation of God. Those Egyptians you see today, you're not going to see them after tomorrow. They're gone. They're finished. Stand still. Can you imagine how two million people would react to that statement? It's tough. And sometimes you need to stand still and let God do the thing. And that's the hardest thing in the world to do. God, I've got a plan. We've got another way to do, deal with that. I saw that in PSSM just recently. I, I don't know if I shared that story last week. We needed to find offices in a hurry. I think I shared it with Barry and Lyndall at their home. We needed to find a new office in a hurry in six weeks. Couldn't find anything. They're up in Moray Field. I live on the Gold Coast. How are we going to find a new office? We rang around the churches that we had links with up there and none of those people came. Said, oh yeah, come on in. 
And uh, I was talking to Andrew Grant about it from CYC. And he said, well, Anne, why don't you go and talk to, to Vern Hazelwood? So I rang Vern up and Vern says, well, we've got an office that's not going to be used this year, Lance, this next year. It's yours. How much, Vern? He said, free. So I went back to our director and I said, well, I've got a place for you to go. Oh, she said, how much is that going to cost? I said, free. And that blew her away. So we went down there for 12 months. They said they were going to extend or they might have been able to extend it for a few more months and then they couldn't do that. They said, no, we need it by the 19th of January. I thought, boy, what are we going to do? Again, we talked to the Lord about it. And again, Andrew Grant was part of the, the answer solution to that. I was down just having a cup of coffee with Andrew. He and I do that from time to time. And we were sharing about the ministries and I was telling what our need was. He said, Lance, we just signed off in Catharaba. We've got plenty of room up there. They've got 300 acres, by the way, CYC at Catharaba. And that 300 acres, he said, why don't you put your office in there free of charge? And so we sat down and we did some stuff. Now, Catharaba is out in the middle of nowhere, for those who have been there. We needed a new director as well. Lord, where's that going to come from? Well, God had already answered that prayer because he's sending up a worker from Yak and Danda to be the manager at Catharaba. And his wife was coming up and she was looking for work and she's a trained teacher. And she's taken on the work for, C for PSSM. We thank God for that. You know, these people came. We only asked God about it. And he provided the answers. We can stand still and let God work these things out. We need to trust him. That's the hardest thing in the world to do. i got to tell you, my committee was, what are you doing about this? And I said, I'm talking to the Lord about it. They thought I was nuts. Guess what? He worked it out in his time and in just the right time for us. Just the right time. We've got to stand firm in that freedom. And then don't go back looking for ways to make it a burden for us. Can you imagine if we had gone in and made, opened up a, a rented a property? There's 15 grand a year we'd have to find. That's a burden. That's slavery. We didn't need to do that. God had a plan and he worked it out for us. Stand firm because you're free. Don't go into bondage. I guess we could almost close in prayer, but we won't do that just now. But then Paul comes back and he says these words. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I like these points. He's always could have, you know, he didn't have a computer, but he could have almost put dot points here for us. Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision. He is obligated to keep the whole law. Go read Leviticus. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For the, through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working for love. If you accept that you have to follow the law, particularly circumcision, Christ is of no advantage to you. If you believe that your, your practices are important, well, what are you doing here today? Because Christ is of no advantage to you. It's as simple as that. But you must keep the whole law. Go home, read, not only read Leviticus, but study it and make it part of your daily life. That's what he's really saying. You've been severed from Christ. Remember Christ talking about, I am the vine, you are the branches. And how the father removes some of those branches from the vine because they're dead and not working. That's what Paul is talking about. Those people who want to do it their way. You know, they want to follow that great American theologian, Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. If you want to do it your way, folks, Christ is pointless for you. You've fallen away from grace. I was reflecting on that. Can you imagine? Here's this wonderful gift that God has given to you and you've fallen away from it and you don't need to be there anymore. It's, how's that? Give it. I, I'm not a millionaire, I can tell you that, but just imagine if I were and I left you some money in my will. It's a nice bit, bit of money in my will. I've already told you that I've already signed it. It's done. All you've got to do is accept it. Now, you know what it is, but I don't want to accept charity. I don't want to take Lance's money. He, he worked hard for that. I don't want to take that. You'd be a fool, wouldn't you? If, especially if you needed some money to help you buy a new car or a new home or whatever. 
or to clear some debts, you'd be a fool. And every person in this world has had a debt. It's called, you are facing death because of sin. And somebody paid the price for you. It's called God's grace. When Jesus hung on the cross for your sin and for my sin. And yet people look at that and they say, oh, well, look, I think there's a better way to impress God. I go to church every Sunday. Every time there's a service on, I'm there. I give out the hymn books. I do this. I do the other thing. I'll even give money to the missionaries. There was little Johnny. He was the cause of all the trouble in the home. Not in my notes, but I just remembered Johnny. And Johnny went out to his mother and he said, Mum, uh, he was in the room just sulking and he said, Mum, I've, look, I, I, I'll wash up for you. She says, No, you won't. Our mothers are strange people. Have you noticed that? Most of us have had mothers. One time you they do something for them and it's a wrong thing to do. Then you go to offer to do it the next day and they don't want you to do it. They're crazy. And then he thought, oh, so he went back in his room and he's thinking for about it for a while. And he said, no, no, I know. Mum, I'll go and mow the lawn for dad. She says, no, you won't. Mothers are really peculiar, strange ladies. Then he's back in his room again and he's thinking very hard about this. What can I do to impress mum? To, to show her that I love her. He said, I know what I'll do. The boys will be down playing rugby down the road I, well, what sport do you guys play here soccer i suppose anyway whatever sport it was i'll take my little sister i'll put her in the stroller i'll have to walk past the soccer ground and i'll be yahooed and everything but it'll be worth it just to get back into mum's good books again so it goes out mum i'll take my sister for a walk she says no you will not go back to your room and he was sitting there thinking what on earth is going on how do you impress mum then all of a sudden the light came on and he walked out to the kitchen mum was still arms deep in soap suds and he looked at his toenails he says mum i'm sorry and she said that's what we've been waiting to hear all morning and she embraced him and she says now you can wash up mow the lawn and take your sister for a walk that's exactly what god is doing for us he doesn't want us to do stuff for him but when we do we are his good work he works for us if you want to do it your way, forget it. But if you want to do it God's way, he will embrace you. They've also lost the hope of righteousness by before, because the Christians have got that. They haven't got that anymore. And when hope goes, life seems pointless. What we do or do not do counts nothing when it talks about God. Uh, there's a guy who's written a book and I can't pronounce his name, so I'm not even going to try to do it. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. When I came to the foot of the cross back in 1964, I simply said, Lord, I've made a mess of my life. If there's something you want to do with it, it's all yours. And he took me and he spun me around that day. I know the Lance Foley who was there the day before, and I know the Lance Foley who was there the next day. And I've got to tell you, they are two different people. Because only God can affect that change, and I could never have done it. There's no reliance on self. It's got to be a reliance upon God. So what went wrong? Well, you were running well, he says. Well, who's hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettled you would emasculate themselves. What went wrong? Now, this passage, this paragraph gives me some hope that these people had not yet embraced circumcision. But they rather were being taught about it. They'd probably bought the book. Some of our false teachers, can, the only way you can understand what they're saying is you've got to buy the book. Generally, it's thick, thicker than the Bible, and you've got to read it in concert. And here's a way. If you want to know whether that book is valid or not, take the Bible verses out of it, all of them. Scrub them all out. 
read the book again. And if it makes sense still, it's obviously not from God. But if you take the Bible verses out and it falls over, it doesn't make sense without the Bible, then it is obviously from the Lord. Just a little tip. So what went wrong? You were running well, he says. God is not the originator of this teaching that had come into the churches in Galatia. This church is of keeping the days, this, this teaching that of circumcision. It was not of God. God did not start it. But it must be dealt with. A little leaven, leaven's the whole lot. Who knows what leaven is? Boy, you're a boring lot, really. Who knows what leaven is? Yeast. Put a little bit of yeast in the flour and it permeates with the whole lot and the bread's supposed to rise. I've never seen a piece of bread, of bread rise yet where you put a little bit of yeast in, don't stir it in, and the outside stays flat and the middle comes up. You ever seen that? I've never seen it. Because it goes everywhere. And here's the problem. If you do not deal with the issue, it will permeate through the whole lot. There will be still people there. Now, it was God who was going to deal with the penalty for this guy who was teaching the wrong teaching. That was God's responsibility. But it was the church's responsibility to teach the truth of what God's word says. And if the person has got no grounds and not making any money out of their false teaching, guess what? They're not going to stay around. But you've got to deal with it. A little leaven will make sure that the whole church falls over. They will receive their penalty, says Paul. That's God's responsibility. And then he talks about, and I'm going to go to the end of that passage, This, um, and I mentioned last time about Atheus. One of the Gallic gods, or actually who was a semi-god, um, his mother was Sebel, and um, Sebel it is. His mother was Sebel, but she was also in, infatuated with him. And he ended up, he was going to be married to the son of um, the daughter of, the king of Macedonia, I think it was. And she turned up at the wedding in just that magical time and he went mad and he castrated himself uh, so he could no longer produce babies, ch children. The whole point behind that is that this Atheist worship, these guys went into a frenzy. Every priest of Atheist was a, was a eunuch. They couldn't produce children. But they used to get in there in that frenzy and they used to run around the place and cut themselves, particularly around the genitalia used to cut themselves something fierce. And Paul is saying, I wish these people would emasculate themselves. And he was reminding them, because they all came out of the pagan worship, he was reminding them that that's what the priests of Atheus did. He said, I wish these people would just completely stop themselves so they become ineffective and meaningless in life. They are going to receive their penalty. He said, why am I still being persecuted? If I don't, if I don't teach this, the, the offense of the cross is being removed. Here's the offense of the cross. Jesus, down from his glory, in love came and knew that he was going to face the death on a cross. He knew that right from the beginning of his journey on this planet. He knew that he was going to be about his father's business. He knew that it was going to cost him his life. He knew it was going to be traumatic. And he knew he had to bear it alone on Calvary. And he did it because he loved you and me. He did it because he knew that there was no other way. That sin could be atoned in this world and removed. He became our propitiation so that we would be free of the burden of sin. And he would give us the ability to stand firm and trust him. If I want to add to the cross something that you must do, I've taken away that offense from the cross. I've said, God didn't do it all. You need to do something too. I was sharing this on one occasion with a young Christian. And she looked at me, she said, but you've got to do something. You know, the only thing you can do to make salvation necessary and work is be a sinner who comes to the foot of the cross and says, Lord, I'm sorry. That's all you can do. You can't wash up, mow the lawn, or take your sister for a walk. It doesn't work. 
You can only trust God. Because that cross that stood there on Golgotha, I don't know whether he was facing Jerusalem when they hung him on that cross. But he probably couldn't see very well anyway because of the way he'd been beaten for you and for me. But he died alone so that we could be called the children of God. The offense of the cross is to add something to it that doesn't fit. And nothing that you and I can do fits into that story. For well, you were called to freedom, brothers. This is almost a repeat of what he said in the beginning verse. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. In other words, for selfish desires. Your freedom is not to desire that, oh, I need to, the latest Maserati. I want to go a bit better than Trevor, you see. Um, let's go Maserati. I reckon a Maserati would beat your car. Just a little bit. But um, I know Trevor and his cars and I go back a long time, as, we, as Trevor said last time. By the way, I was scared more than you. They thought I was your brother. My goodness me, you, made, you thought you were weird. I was more than that, Trevor. But we're going to spend eternity in heaven. I hope, yeah, we'll be able to No Maseratis in heaven, by the way, I don't think. For the whole law is fulfilled, he says, in this one word. You shall love, and there's the word, love, your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Let's unpack this very quickly. Freedom is not a license to go and do whatever you want to do. Paul deals with that in Romans 5. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. I don't need to add to God's grace. His, his grace is full and complete. I can just take it as his word. What he said he did on the cross, he did. And boy, am I grateful he paid the price for my sin. He's given me a hope that is sure in eternity. But here's what he's done. He's given me the freedom to serve other people. I, when I was born, I didn't want to serve anybody. I, didn't want to, I certainly didn't want to wash up ever um, for my mother. I didn't want to go and do anything. I, all the things were mine. They were me, me, me. That's the way we learn life. And that's the way we look at the world. When the looks, world looks at freedom, they talk about what you're going to benefit from it rather than what the corporate body is going to be. But I have the opportunity to serve my neighbor. Now, Paul here doesn't say who these neighbors are, but I think the context is within the church. It may not be. It may be the whole of Galatia. Howard Hendricks, who was a, a don at uh, Dallas Theological College, said on one occasion about this guy, this young pastor came up, he said he lived in one of these Midwest towns in America. It was largely made up around prostitution and also the gaming industry. And the, 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 guy, the kingpin in the town, a rather evil man, the pimp and so on. And this young pastor said, how do I reach this guy? For him, he says, well, you serve him. He said, how do I do that? He said, oh, God, I'll show it to you. Well, he heard this man was sick. And he drove past his house one day, and as he's driving past his house, he noticed his lawn that was the best lawn in the city was long and needed cutting. He said, what am I going to do about it? And he thought, I know. And he went back home, got his son, got his mower and his whipper snipper out and came back and cut this guy's lawn without asking, just cut it. And this man walked to the front door and said, what are you doing? He said, well, Jesus loves you and I'm cutting your lawn. He said, you're crazy. But you know what? It was only a few months later that guy was in church and that man found the risen Christ because this man was prepared to serve him in such a mundane thing. Of your neighbours, what can you do for them that would make them take notice of your walk with the Lord Jesus? Just a thought. Love your neighbours. Love one another. Philippians 2, 3. I noticed, uh, and I said to Richard this morning, I noticed that he read from Philippians 2 last week. I said, I bet you didn't read the first five verses, and he didn't. He admitted that he didn't do that. But I said, look at this verse. Philippians 2, 3 says in a translation, let each esteem others better than themselves, yourself. Can you imagine what this church would be like if everybody in this church thought that everybody else was more important than they were? Just imagine that for a moment. 
If you put everybody else in this church ahead of you, what would this church be like? And right, they're doing the same thing, putting you ahead of them. As a young Christian said to me, Mr. Foley, you'd never put the fire out. Folks, if we really followed the principles that Paul lays down in scripture, you would never put the fire out. And you'd need a fire because you'd have to burn the place down to build a bigger one. Love your neighbor as yourself, he said. If we don't do that, if we, all we do is bicker and fight, the church is going to die. Sadly, that happened to many churches in Turkey, many churches in Galatia, who didn't stop fighting. Folks, Mike can only say to you, stand firm, trust God, and he will bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its challenges. We thank you, Father, that there's not one thing we can do to make your salvation more important or more purposeful. Because Jesus paid it all. And it's truth, Father, we do owe everything to you. But, Father, you give this to us as a gift. Father, help us to be free and to understand what that freedom is. Help us to serve one another. Help us to consider others as more preeminent than ourselves and father we pray today that you will take these words and use them for the benefit of your kingdom we ask it in jesus name amen